And as you may well know, Emerson has been developing a low capital cost, high return potash mine project near Chemiset in northern Morocco. We've been hearing about this exciting potash project for a few years now, but Emerson have just secured significant investment funding for almost 47 uh, US, uh, million US dollars. I'll say that again, 47 million US dollars. That's a substantial uh, uh, sum of cash. And Graham Clark and his commercial director, Charles Vaughan, will talk us through the development of Chemiset from this point onwards. Welcome, Graham. Welcome, Charles. Thanks, Donald, and good evening to everybody. So we just moved to the, to the summary uh, slide, uh, the first slide. Um, I think just to reiterate what Donald's just said, we, we signed a deal last week and announced that. That really is a, a trigger and you know a game changer for us because it allows us really now to, to proceed apace with the project. This sort of summarizes the highlights of the project. 1.4 billion net asset value, that was from the feasibility study, which was completed in, in 2020. But if you look at now the, the potash price over $800, a ton in some markets that actually pushes the, the NAV up closer to $4 billion. So a very high value product uh, project. In terms of, of the, um, the output, the potash, there's an increasing demand year on year, and, and that will continue, and we'll cover that off in a, in a slide in a moment. Very low cost when in production. Everything we've done, we've done to the highest standards uh, in country in terms of the environmental and, and social governance and compliance. We have a very supportive um, country in, in terms of Morocco. All of the authorities are very supportive of the project. They see the benefits the project will bring. And with an initial 19 year life with an opportunity to, to probably double that with the resource that we have, we have a long, a long life uh, project here. One of the key things though, key development um, there in the top right hand corner of this slide, we have the expertise in, in place. I joined the company last year with the with sole aim of actually building and operating this project and, and that is what we're focused on. I've got huge experience in the potash world having operated the only potash mine in, in the UK, Cleveland Potash, for a number of years and also have the development experience to take this project through into construction. So it's really key to understand that we are going to build this project. And the announcement last week actually really gives us the, the kickstart to be able to do all of the work now to take us into construction. This slide just, just sort of simply shows the, the reason for the increase uh, in demand for potash. Increased population, yes, but crop production is outstripping the increase in, in population. That's due to the demands of of the world's people who want a, you know, a greater variety of food. And the potash demand increases above that because as we grow more, we deplete the, the potash, the potassium in the soil, and we need to apply more fertilizer. So typically we're looking at a, an increase in demand of one and a half to two million tons per annum for the product. So with our size product project, which is just is under a million tons per year, plenty of room for us to come into the market. And even with people talking about BHP in the future, that will, by the time that comes into sort of first phase operations of 5 million tonnes per year, there will have been an increased demand, you know, three times that in the market. The location, Morocco, we talk a lot about that. It's a great country, great infrastructure. But it's also worth noting that it is actually a fertiliser hub. OCP, the world's largest phosphate producer. Um, you can see their mines there on, on, this, on this slide. They operated in, in the ports of Jos, Lusfar, Casablanca. So actually Morocco is already a, a country that understands fertilizer, the benefits of the economy, the needs for that. And it's a gateway to Africa for our product to be either used in Morocco or Africa as a whole. We did a socioeconomic study and it, it's worth just, just focusing on a couple of these highlights here, just under 2,400 jobs created. And that's in a part of Morocco where they're crying out for, for employment and good quality employment. So we have a transformational impact on the local local economy with a 40% increase in the in the local GDP. So significant investments and obviously this is very well understood in country by all of all levels of, of, of the government. We talk about our logistical advantage and, and this slide just sort of summarizes that. So we compare shipping our products, MOP, to one of the main markets in Brazil where currently the spot price is a well north of, of $800 a tonne and compare our cost of doing that to the cost of the incumbent Canadian producers in Saskatchewan. We've shown this slide quite a lot, but it's still just worth bearing in mind that with their costs, their royalties, their transport costs to the port of Vancouver, and then shipping to Brazil, compared to ours, we have over a hundred dollar a ton advantage in terms of the margin that we make on our product compared to them if we ship to, the, to that market in Brazil. 
just on this slide, we, we summarize the, the difference between our project and a typical Canadian potash development. And the key things here on the left, we look at the, the sort of CapEx implications. Our deposit is shallow. We can access that through two declines. There's no aquifers. So it's a low risk, low cost development to access the, the resource. And then we're very close to the port. So a very short journey to take the product to a port where there's excess capacity in Casablanca. And I was there recently talking to the port operators and it's very clear they could accommodate all of our product and, and the salt as well that we want to ship from Casablanca. And we've already talked about logis logistical benefits that we have. If you look at a Canadian potash project, a billion dollars to sink the shafts, deep shafts through aquifers, high risk. This is a, we have a completely different project here, which is low risk and low capex to actually get into operations. So I'm over to Charles now, next two or three slides. Thanks, Graham. Um, so we, we have to, apologies for all those who know this well enough and, and feel like we're going back over the same territory and you're seeing the same <clears> slides, but it is important. We have to assume there are new people listening. So um, this slide we've got here, I, I, I wanna talk about this relative, for instance, to the last presentation we've just seen, which has an obvious massive catalyst coming with a spud. What we have is a, a very considerable nav upside to play for in the equity. And the question is always, how do we go about closing that? With this deal we've just announced, we have, we have basically de-risked a large part of the hardest part of the project finance. The hardest part being the project equity, the easier part being the debt. Of course, the share price has moved up well. Um, we've gone to 7p. That's great. But as, as you can see here, you know, a $75 million market cap relative to a project nav of 1.4 on the old long-term potash price still leaves a, a huge amount of running room for the equity. So what investors, unlike waiting for one big catalyst like a spub, what they're looking for here is a constant de-risking of the project. So we've had this very important piece of news come through on the strategic investor. And I think the next thing is um, to see how the rest of the financing falls together and therefore how we can actually start um, accreting up to the 20, 25% of NAV that I would expect a decent quality project to actually trade for in the pre-production stages. And, and we talk about decent quality. Um, I am just going to move my screen so I can see the Brazil spot price assumptions here. You, I mean, if, you, if we were selling our product now, we would be selling it at 800 a tonne. The whole finance, the whole construction would be paid off in a little over a year. The project now, as Graham said, is, is $3.9 billion after tax. I mean, this is, this is incredibly good numbers. Um, Yep, we're not selling potash at the moment, but I can tell you it's certainly been very helpful in our negotiations with the strategic that the potash price has provided such a buoyant backdrop. And I would expect it to be helpful not only with the um, debt uh, piece of the project, which we will, we will start moving into right now, um, but also likely with the next tranche of equity, which would be the final tranche. So um, yes, not selling the product, but yes, also selling the investment in this backdrop is hugely important. And just to, just to sort of clear up uh, how the structure of this deal was arrived at, um, it, it took a lot of negotiating um, and the merchant bank um, GQC, who was negotiating on behalf of GSM, ultimately decided to co-invest with GSM. Um, and the deal that we structured uh, was, well, it's neat for us because the upfront equity in cash at six pence, it was, it was a small premium to the then share price, fine. That is very important money for us because it enables us to do all of the work which otherwise would have um, been waiting on a, a cash infusion. The balance 40 million sits there waiting for the conditions precedent to be met. But the main one of those is that the whole project finance is put in place, by which we mean all of the project debt and the, the final tranche of the equity. So it sits there 
as a way of giving comfort to the project lenders looking at this, that we are going to have the whole piece and therefore they do need to do their work and put in place their offers. And when the whole piece is there, we can draw it down. And the interest rate that a lot of people talk about, 9%, it's, we consider that a perfectly good one. We would have preferred 2%, they would have preferred 18. 9% is what would be payable for a maximum possible amount of time of two years. But in all likelihood, when all of the project finance is put in place, the NAV will close from 5% as it is now to more like 20, 25%. And the share price won't be 7p, but it'll be north of the 16p easily. Um, in which case, all of these uh, converts, mandate they, they, they have a mandatory convert on them. So they all become equity straight away after one month of that. And the interest rate stops. So... The, the backdrop, the, the worst case scenario is that this runs for the maximum of two years and then converts at 8.2p. But the more likely scenario is that once all of the project is put in place and we're going into construction, the share price is a lot higher and these have become shares. So just to clear that up on the interest rate. And, and one, of the, one of the most important things that isn't lost on anyone is the fact that by putting this play putting this deal in place, it accelerates all of our negotiations with the other project financiers. And I mean, primarily the debt funders, who is, you know, they're the next port of call for us, but also, of course, the other people who, the other parties in the, in the data room who were um, interested in, in taking a significant piece of, of this company uh, are miles more likely to come forward now. So, rather than it being a question of us having shot our bolt with the most likely strategic, I would say it's actually become much more likely that a second strategic enters the fray. Um, so yeah, it's for us, it's a wonderful deal. Thanks, Charles. So what I'd like to do now is, um, I'm not sure what everybody wants to know is what we're doing next. So I just want to talk a little bit now about the project execution. And this is work that preparation for this work has been going on for the last six or eight months, um, as you'll see from, from one of the slides shortly. So this is all about how we're going to deliver the projects. And this is really important. Obviously, you can't build a project without the funding, but equally, you can't build a project without a plan and an execution strategy to actually deliver it. And I think that is really important that everybody understands we're setting ourselves up here to deliver this project. And there's been a lot of work been going on. It's not the sort of stuff that we can report on, particularly uh, as we go forward, that will, will more likely be the case. Um, but I just wanted to go through how we're actually going to deliver this project. So basically this slide just shows we've, we've divided the project up into seven work packages. This shows the first four, which is the number one highways connection. Number two is the process plant. Three is the portal and declines to access the mine. And number four is the remainder of the, the surface infrastructure. And on this next slide, we see the, the remaining three packages. Five is the tailing storage facility. And six and seven are the two things that we have to bring to site, which is the power uh, via a connection, 15 kilometer connection to the, to the main power grid. And number seven is the water, which is, is going to be a 20 kilometer supply uh, from the upstream of a dam um, fairly close to the project. So those are the, the seven packages we've focused on in, our, in working out how we're actually going to deliver this project. This next slide shows you know what, what we've come to so we're looking at a, ultimately an EPCM contractor to help us deliver this project but the first first step with the seven packages is that we will actually put out the basic design um, ourselves to the appropriate engineering companies um, we're separating out the process uh, plant um, to to actually go to a specialist uh, engineering company and that will be awarded first and the remaining six will actually probably go to the same contractor who may well then become our EPCM partner as we go forward. So we've had a lot of engagement with, with a number of companies. And on the next slide, we can sort of see the, the level of, uh, of work that's gone into this already. So in terms of the process facility package, we actually went out for expressions of interest, pre-qualification uh, going back to April of this year. Um, we got uh, proposals back. We've actually negotiated the price. And by mid-June, we actually have that package ready uh, to go. 
but we weren't in a position with with the cash available to actually commit to that piece of work because that is quite a large uh, costly piece of work um so that's been been held back but we're now in the final stages of of of, of getting the contract in place and the expectation is that we will actually have that package awarded uh, and placed by the end of this month and that will be something obviously we'll update on uh, when we get to that point in terms of the other six packages which is also a substantial amount of work um we went through a some discussions actually largely in country with potential engineering companies that could deliver this. We went out for expressions of interest, pre-qualification at the beginning of October. And right now we're actually in a position where we are awaiting uh, proposals back from four companies. Uh, we actually had seven uh, that we went out to initially. We actually picked four of those. All of those with international uh, experience and internationally uh, recognizable expertise. Um, so a very detailed pro process, a lot of work gone into that, a lot of feedback, interactions, clarifications provided, uh, but we should be in a position if we get those proposals back by the end of this month, which is the intent, that by the end of the year we should be somewhere near ready to actually award those packages and then we can actually push forward uh, with the work that we need to do to prepare us for, for construction. And I actually see this as sort of, you know, early construction, pre-construction work because the cost of all of this engineering was actually included in the uh, in the feasibility study capex estimate so the money that we've just got with the deal we did last year is a massive trigger as, as charles has said for us to get the rest of the funding in place but it is also a trigger for us to be able to get on with this work which puts us in a really good position uh, to commence construction this next slide just shows uh, work that's that's been ongoing i think we've reported this in, in updates we've got drilling work going on on site uh, so a series of, of deeper holes along the decline and also a couple of additional holes um, into the ore body. So we, we've done a couple of the holes on the decline already um, and the remainder of that is ongoing and that will be completed in the first part of next year. We've done a large number of, of surface shallow you know, geological investigations and also some geophysical work. And that's to inform the design that we're now uh, about ready to start for all of the surface infrastructure, uh, the, the process facility, um, the, the, and creating the portal for the declines. So all of that work is, is, is almost complete, the shallow work, and that will provide the data to the, to the engineering companies to do the design. And then on, on the right, just showing the, the core store uh, out in Chemiset. And I have to say, you know, I've been in there a, a couple of times, and the standards, the way that the core has been looked after, logged and, and protected is, is second to none and, and really good. So there's a lot of good work been going on over the last few months. Uh, to get all of this data ready for the for the engineering design uh, one minute to go graham uh, that's all i need donald um this is just to shows the sort of the you know the the milestones that we've ticked off culminating in the um, strategic equity in, in the in the fourth quarter of this year um and obviously loads more work to do but that really does allow us now to to crack on with the the work that we have to complete and i'll just leave this slide up um, it is really important that you know we use the the, the words we'll always do the right thing and do them in the right way, and that is you know fundamental to the way that we're delivering this project, our interactions in country, um, you know, and the way that we're actually going to go forward. So uh, that's that's it from the presentation, uh, Donald. So we're we're happy now to take some questions if you have any. Fantastic. Well, I certainly have some, and uh, uh, Sean McInnesby has one. Uh, he asks, when is the ESIA due? Now, is that the environmental uh, impact study? Yes, that is. Um, and, you know, we were we were hopeful that we would have had that earlier in the year. Uh, that's been a very detailed um, process. We, we did put an update out fairly recently about that. We've had to go back and, and provide additional data uh, to the authorities. You know, we believe now that we've, we've fulfilled all the requirements and we are still you know, waiting for a, a final meeting and the approval, the formal approval to come through. So, you know, we, we do expect that in the not too distant future. I, I would say, is that just sim not simply in the nature of permitting and so on? It may look simple and straightforward on the surface, but in reality, uh, these things happen? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it does take time. I, you know, we were, you know, I'll hold my hands up to being over optimistic previously with that. Um, but, you know, it does take time. It, it needs to be right. We, you know, we've made sure we, we've delivered everything that, you know, we believe we have to do and, you know, given them, given them, you know, the input for them to make the decision um undoubtedly there are things that have you know sort of come in the way of that process the pandemic no doubt and, and other things the change of government in the country 
but you know it is it is there and you know that process will will come through i think it's important to note that you know with the investment the you know the, our strategic partner has done all of the due diligence they've looked at this in detail they don't see that as a concern we don't see it as a concern you know it's just a matter of time um excellent a a, a general question from the lec chat board what counts as pre-construction and what counts as construction um, this this may be may be subjective. I'll give you I'll give you my view. I, you know I believe the work that we're doing. You know once we've got the basic engineering um, on underway, that 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 is sort of pre construction work. As I said, the you know the cost of that was included in the in the capex estimate in the feasibility study. Um, you know so I think that is that is getting us ready for construction. You know actual construction is when we sort of physically break ground, which will be you know once we've got to financial close. And when might that be? When might Actual physical physical construction is it uh, Q one now? Do you think more likely? I, I, you know, I think we're 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 now really in the hands of, of the banks. They will sort of dictate the speed with which we can get the debt funding in place. You know, and you know, it is now down to them. You know, they were needing for us to give them an indication that we we had the equity, you know, side of uh, of the of the final financing, not necessarily completely in place, but that we we gave a good indication that we had a strategic cornerstone investor in place. We've delivered that now, so the conversations with the banks will speed up, um, undoubtedly. And you know, really, the, the length of that process is down to their their due diligence and you know, getting getting that you know all pulled together um, and everything signed off. So, yeah, you know, we will update on that when we have a, a clearer picture on you know on what the time is going to be. Stephen Peake asks an inter interesting question. He says he, he, he titles it "Inflation." You've begun the tender processes. How is pricing likely to compare with the original budget study, with your feasibility study? Uh, he means, I think. Well, we've we have done, you know, we have done some work uh, along the way. There's been nothing identified that you know where we we see any dramatic increases in costs. Um, steel prices are maybe higher. Other things are maybe cheaper. So I think the you know this engineering phase will give us a much clearer picture of that and you know any any significant issues, but. There's nothing we've identified that, that gives us any concern at this at this point in time. Okay, uh, perhaps one for Charles here. To what extent does the fundraise further de-risk the project and make it easier to raise funds? And what are the next financing steps? How much can you tell us? Um, yeah, well, as, as I was saying just before, it makes it miles easier for us um, to have this uh, supportive 29.9% shareholder. G GSM is it's a pool of... Um, uh, very high net worth uh, guys from uh, Asia who are basically investing in development projects outside of Asia. They've invested in some assets in Australia and in the US and now this one um, in order to take them straight through into construction. Having someone like that with pockets, deep pockets and, and being supportive makes all of the equity um, issuance much easier. Uh, and what I would also note is they, they, they are going to be long-term shareholders, but they were not the off-takers we were expecting to have to give away uh, to get a strategic. So we still have the off-take in hand. And we certainly consider that to be quite a trump card. And it might mean that the final tranche of equity is actually done with another strategic who actually wants the off-take. So... The banks we've never really seriously um, had a problem with. They the, the project has very high margins, so they all want to lend. But you know, with a market cap our size, they were all concerned that we wouldn't find the equity. I think we're we're showing a pathway to that now, and it's it. People are going to realise, wow, this thing could actually start trading up to a sort of a more normal NAV discount. Um, okay. They don't need to they don't need to issue stock in the market because of this six point seven five upfront. You brought us to offtake. So where are you with the offtake agreement? Where are you with SALT? And what's your relationship with OCP? Are they a potential strategic still in the background for you? There's uh, four or five questions there, Donald. Um, I'll try Only three, four. Graham. Only three. Only three, okay. <laughs> um, so with the, with the, the potash offtake, as, as Charles has said, we still have that. We have ongoing conversations with um, potential customers who have an interest in the offtake, which may or may not involve uh, some element of funding. So those conversations are ongoing. We will move forward with that now as we, you know, we've got a clear sort of run into to the debt funding being in place. So we know we need to have some offtakes in place. Potash, I don't see any issues, you know, with delivering that. 
the salt, we're now working on that. We're engaged with um, some potential customers, but the target with the salt is we're actually, you know, targeting 2 million tons minimum offtake uh, for the salt, for de-icing salt, um, rather than the 1 million assumption that's in the feasibility study. And again, confident that we, we can get that in place. With regards to OCP, um, our focus, and, and this is something that I am really pushing with the whole, the whole team on the board, our focus is on delivering this project. If OCP want to come and talk to us, they can come and talk to us. Um, but you know, our focus is on delivering this project. Ultimately, they're an obvious customer for the product because they, they import MOP uh, into the country. But you know, we we feel the best way for us to to get the best value is for us to push on and you know put ourselves in a position to deliver this. And with the the strategic partner on board who are very supportive and you know want to build this project, we now have the pathway to do to do in, in exactly that. Okay, excellent answer to my three questions. Um, let me let me turn to politics. I was either going to do it at the start or at the at the end, so we're coming to the end. So. Um, Morocco has a new post-Islamist government and a new Minister of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development. What yeah. do you make of them, Graham or Charles, equally? And are you keen to meet with Leila Ben Ali, who's the new Minister of Energy Transition? What are yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think the I, mean, I was in Morocco just sort of after the after the elections and when it was clear, you know, who the new government was going to be and. You know, everybody I spoke to in the country were, you know, really excited about the prospect of, of what this government would bring and their approach to the economy. And actually, you know, they'd had a, a period of a government talking about doing a lot of stuff, but not actually doing much stuff. So they were, you know, really enthused by, um, by the appointments that were being made by the prime minister and the appointments. So, you know, I think we, we feel the same. You know, everything they're talking about doing fits exactly with what we want to do in the country, which is, you know, deliver this project. Uh, for the benefits that it brings. There's very strong ties between the UK and Morocco and, and you know, growing stronger, um, maybe post-Brexit, but, but, you know, we're seen as a very, very strong partner for, for Morocco. So absolutely looking forward to meeting um, the ministers. Um, travel's become a little bit more complex again to get in and out of Morocco. Um, but the plan is um, that we, you know, we'll be out there certainly in the new year, if not before, and, and lining up some 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 meetings so that we can actually talk about our project and you know get it make sure everybody understands what we're doing and the benefits it comes. Excellent. My final question from Lloyd Phillips, a two-part question and again, I'm afraid. He says he would like to see more RNSs or communication around things like the construction start date. Um, and he would and, and, and a more supplementary point, he'd like a more steady flow of tweets and pictures to illustrate the smaller but nonetheless interesting moments. You know, for example, the new machinery is purchased new staff are welcomed and meetings take place. So more RNSs at the, at the top level, more comms at a lower level. Uh, That's my bad, you... Lloyd. Thanks. Um, what, are, we, what, are, uh... what are your thoughts on that, guys? Uh, <laughs> so comms, so comms listen, we, the project? We, we, we put out usually three tweets a week, which I consider quite a lot for a, for a corporate. Um, we we're quite active on LinkedIn and RNS is obviously only for um, price sensitive information. So you have to just release that as it's appropriate rather than use it as a marketing instrument. But um, I, I think in fairness to Lloyd, we, we probably have been in a slightly frustratingly quiet period because we've been negotiating um, uh, the, this sort of deal, which you just can't talk about during the negotiations and though we've been doing stuff on the ground, it's not been anything like the quantum that you're now going to see as Graham activates all this sort of pre-construction activity. So hopefully, even though you might not see many more than three tweets a week, hopefully there'll be more, there'll be more news to talk about. And if it's not RNS, we'll, we will make use of other media outlets to get it out so that people can fully engage again with the progress, which will be more demonstrable. Charles, yeah, yeah second, second that, uh, you know, we, at times we're, we're sort of limited to what we can put out. There's a lot more going on now and I encourage all of the guys to take photographs of not everything, you know, anything that might be interesting. You know, so the, it is the intent to, to make sure that we're, we're updating as we go. And as, as Charles just said, there's, there's a lot more activity, a lot more interesting stuff. It certainly interests me and, and excites me and, you know, we'll, we'll share that as, you know, as, as much as we can. Okay, uh, uh, 
Graham Clark, CEO at Emerson, and Charles Vaughan, commercial director. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As I say, I'm a big fan of your project, and I've been following it for a long time. And it's terrific to see you doing well. Thank you so much for joining us.